This is a homily for the twelfth Sunday in Ordinary Time. The first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 10 to 13. The second reading comes from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. And the gospel for this Sunday comes from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 26 to to 33. Matthew's Gospel arranges the teaching of Jesus into five major discourses. The first major discourse is the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus instructs the disciples on who they must be and how they must live. They are to be salt and light. Today we continue reading from the second of the five discourses, which is directed more specifically to the twelve disciples, empowering and instructing them for mission. Although these missionary instructions are directed to the disciples during the lifetime of Jesus, Matthew the Evangelist is also mindful of later generations of Christians who will experience persecutions and trials. Matthew's Gospel was most likely written sometime between 70 and 100 AD, when disciples of Jesus in Judea found themselves marginalized or even expelled by local Jewish communities. Keep that in mind as we turn to today's Gospel. Let's begin our reflection with a quiz, a Bible quiz. Here's your first question. Which command is repeated most often in the Bible? Repent. Do not judge. Love one another. Proclaim that the kingdom of God is close at hand. Take up your cross and follow me. Be compassionate. Forgive one another. Doubt no longer, but believe. Stay awake. Treat others as you would like them to treat you. So, which of the ten is the command that is repeated most often in the Bible? In fact, it's none of these ten. The most often repeated command is me fobethete, which means, do not be afraid. So, if Jesus tells us not to be afraid, what is there to be afraid of? Well, let's begin by considering the cosmic setting of the biblical story. God created humans to have dominion over the rest of creation. But the actual situation is just the reverse. Sin came into the world, as St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, which is today's second reading. But also, humans are possessed by demons, racked by illnesses, and at the mercy of the forces of nature. Then we have the socio-political setting of the biblical story. At the time of Jesus, the Jewish people are oppressed. Roman armies occupy Israel. Caesar is Lord. The leaders of Israel, appointed by and accountable to Roman authorities, dominate the Judean people. So, both the cosmic and the socio-political settings of the gospel story are sources of threat and therefore of fear. But the good news is that there is nothing to fear because a great force is on the horizon. Jesus begins his proclamation with the message, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. And for that reason, Jesus offers the twelve two powerful reasons why they should not be afraid. Firstly, 
he tells them that everything that is now covered will be uncovered, and everything now hidden will be made clear. New Testament scholar Tom Wright explains, Their resolute determination to follow the Lord of life wherever he leads will be vindicated. Truth will out. Justice will prevail. Those who have lived with integrity and innocence, despite what the world says about them, will be vindicated. And secondly, Jesus tells the disciples, Can you not buy two sparrows for a penny, and yet not one falls to the ground without your father knowing? Why, every hair on your head has been counted. So there is no need to be afraid. You are worth more than hundreds of sparrows. In the words of Tom Wright, You are worth more than a great many sparrows, so rest assured that God knows and cares about the details of your life, even as you face the temptations and dangers which so easily surround you. Followers of Jesus are bound to expect attacks at all levels, but they should also learn that the one they are serving is stronger than the strongest opponent they will ever meet. In today's first reading, the prophet Jeremiah, tortured and imprisoned, is confident in the power of God to save him despite those who seek his downfall. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Perhaps he will be seduced into error. Then we will master him and take our revenge. Jeremiah is not intimidated. But the Lord is at my side, a mighty hero. My opponents will stumble, mastered, confounded by their failure. Jesus tells the twelve not to be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear those who can destroy both body and soul in hell. There are two faces of the human emotion of fear. On the one hand, fear alerts us to danger. In Moby Dick, Herman Melville's epic saga on whaling, the first mate Starbuck says that the only men that he wants in his boat are men who are afraid of whales. Those who are afraid truly know the power and awesome strength of their adversary and are not likely to be foolhardy. But fear can also be debilitating. We hear of people being paralysed with fear. That is the kind of fear that Jesus has in mind when he tells his disciples not to be afraid. Jesus assures his disciples that everyone who acknowledges him in the presence of others, he will acknowledge in the presence of his Father in heaven. But whoever denies him in the presence of others, he will deny in the presence of his Father in heaven. New Testament scholar Brendan Byrne offers this reflection on these words of Jesus. If we never experience discomfort and embarrassment in professing and living the faith, if we never have to confess Jesus in a way that means standing apart from the crowd, have we truly heard the good news for which at our baptism we were claimed? In an essay in aid of a grammar of assent, St. John Henry Newman makes a useful distinction between notional assent and real assent. When I give notional assent, it means that I agree, but it has absolutely no impact on my life. Real assent, by way of contrast, means that something becomes real to me. It has a profound and transformative influence in defining who I am and what I do. That, of course, is the assent that Jesus seeks 
when he calls a person to be his disciple. Sadly, however, that is not the kind of assent that many contemporary disciples of Jesus are prepared to give. We live in a secular age, and for many people, religious commitment is just one option among many. This is an issue that the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor addresses in his book, A Secular Age. He examines the question of belief in God in pre-modern societies and that of citizens living in a modern Western state. The change I want to define and trace is one which takes us from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God to one in which faith, even for the staunchest believer, is one possibility among others. Belief in God is no longer axiomatic. Taylor describes this transition as moving from what he calls the porous self to the buffered self. Consider this metaphor. The pre-modern person swam in the waters of faith like a fish in water. By way of contrast, the buffered self may or may not take a plunge in the pool. It's there as an option for those who want it. Another way of looking at the difference between pre-modern societies and the modern Western state is this. In pre-modern societies, everything means something. In the modern Western state, nothing ultimately means anything. The English historian Christopher Dawson uses the analogy of a plant. Every culture is like a plant. It must have its roots in the earth, and for sunlight it needs to be open to the spiritual. At the present moment, we are busy cutting its roots and shutting out all light from above. The Jewish theologian Will Herberg says something similar in his book Judaism and Modern Man. He has coined the term cut flower syndrome. He explains the significance of the term. Cut flowers retain their original beauty and fragrance, but only so long as they retain the vitality that they have drawn from their now severed roots. After that is exhausted, they wither and die. So with freedom, brotherhood, justice and personal dignity, the values that form the moral foundation of our civilization, without the life-giving power of the faith out of which they have sprung, they possess neither meaning nor vitality. In calling and forming the twelve, Jesus seeks real assent. They are to be porous, in the sense that their faith must pervade every aspect of their lives. In The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer poses this question. And if we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? He makes the distinction between cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace seeks all the consolations of the faith without commitment or conversion. And then there is costly grace. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a person will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price, to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the call of Jesus Christ, at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Such grace is costly, because it calls us to follow, 
and it is grace because it gives a person the only true life. The story of Bonhoeffer's life is a story of costly grace. Bonhoeffer staunchly and vocally opposed Hitler and the Nazi regime. In June 1939, not long before the declaration of war, he was invited to lecture at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. He would have been safe there. But after a very brief stay in America, he knew he must return home to Germany. Costly grace never seeks the easy and comfortable way out. He explained the reason for his return home to Germany. I have come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Bonhoeffer was arrested in April 1943 and sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. He was hanged by the Nazis on the 9th of April 1945 at Flossenburg concentration camp. Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons, is also a story of costly grace. The play is about Thomas More, appointed Lord Chancellor of England in 1529. Lord Chancellor was the realm's highest office. The King, Henry VIII, had consulted More as early as 1527 with regard to his proposed divorce from Catherine of Aragon. After a long study of the problem, More had told the king that he could not support him in this matter. But many influential and powerful people did support the king. You can see here a photo of a letter sent to Pope Clement VII pleading for the annulment of the king's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. The letter includes the wax seals of the members of the English House of Lords, clergy and other nobility who wrote and sign the letter. There is a scene in Bolt's play where Henry visits Moore at his home in Chelsea. The king tells Moore, I have no son. It is my bounden duty to put away the queen, and all the popes back to St. Peter shall not come between me and my duty. How is it that you cannot see? Everyone else does. Then why does your grace need my poor support? Because you're honest. What's more to the purpose, you're known to be honest. There are those like Norfolk who follow me because I wear the crown. And there are those like Master Cromwell who follow me because they are jackals with sharp teeth and I am their lion. And there is a mass that follows me because it follows anything that moves. And there is you. However, it soon became obvious that the Pope was not going to accede to Henry's request and that he must break with Rome if he was to marry Anne Boleyn. On May 15, 1532, the clergy made their complete submission to the King and Moore resigned his office as Lord Chancellor. Moore was charged with high treason and beheaded on Tower Hill on July the 6th, 1535. The king's good servant, but God's first. You can still visit the site of his execution. A plaque at the site names him as one who was executed there. You'll notice also the name of John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, who was also executed because he would not support the king in the matter of his annulment. Moore was canonised by Pope Pius XI in 1935. The life of the American civil rights campaigner Martin Luther King is another example of real assent and costly grace. 
Due to my involvement in the struggle for the freedom of my people, I have known very few quiet days in the last few years. I have been imprisoned in Alabama and Georgia jails 12 times. My home has been bombed twice. A day seldom passes that my family and I are not the recipients of threats of death. I have been the victim of a near-fatal stabbing. So, in a real sense, I have been battered by the storms of persecution. I prayed, Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. And it seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. His tomb is in Atlanta, Georgia close by the Ebenezer Baptist Church where he joined his father as co-pastor. King could have had a very successful and comfortable ministry there, but he could not ignore the struggle for civil rights. On February the 4th, 1968, King preached at Ebenezer Baptist Church a sermon entitled the drum major instinct. He told the congregation that he sometimes thought about his own death and funeral. When that day came, he said, he didn't want people to talk about his Nobel Peace Prize or his degrees or hundreds of awards. What then would he like people to say of him? I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind, but I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. King was assassinated two months to the day after giving this sermon. When the restoration of the Western Towers of Westminster Abbey was completed in 1995, the decision was made to place statues in the ten niches above the Western Doorway, but not statues of traditional saints. Instead, it was decided Christian martyrs of the 20th century should be remembered, both Catholic and Protestant. Here you can see three of the ten statues. From left to right, Martin Luther King, Archbishop Oscar Romero and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Their lives bore witness to the words of Jesus in today's Gospel. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul.